It's a pleasure to be here and introduce our speaker tonight and, and to see all of you in attendance. Ambassador Davis is the Special Representative of the Secretary of State for North Korea Policy. Uh, the second person to formally uh, occupy this position after Ambassador Stephen Bosworth. Uh, he was appointed in January 2012 by Secretary of State Clinton to facilitate uh, U.S. policy of engagement uh, with uh, North Korea and the other parties of uh, the six-party talk process uh, uh, in, in, in the policy of engagement with North Korea, as well as other aspects of security, political, economic, human rights, and humanitarian assistance uh, with regard to North Korea. He's a career member of the, C of the Foreign Service, and his previous positions have been a permanent representative of the United States to the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, and the UN uh, office in Vienna uh, from 2009 until his most recent appointment. And he has also been a principal Dep deputy assistant secretary of state of the Bureau of East Asian Pacific Affairs and executive secretary of the National Security Council staff. I've also been informed that his father was a proud alumnus of Columbia University. Um, and with that, uh, please welcome Ambassador Glenn Davis. Well, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Professor uh, Armstrong, for that kind uh, introduction. And I want to thank President Sakurai for having the uh, for having taken the initiative of inviting me to come here uh, this evening. We had the happy uh, coincidence, as so often happens uh, in this life, of. Uh, being seated next to each other at a diplomatic function uh, in Washington. It's where a lot of the networking happens uh, at these diplomatic dinners. Um, and uh, bless him, he remembered me and, and invited me to come on up to New York um, and uh, speak to you uh, this evening. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to uh, have the opportunity to, to do so. I'm, I'm uh, also um, quite uh, honored to uh, be doing this tonight with, uh, uh, with uh, Charles Armstrong, whose work on Korea is uh, renowned. Uh, one article he wrote that I saw the title of on a website uh, caught my eye. I have to read it. I just read this uh, uh, minutes ago. It was entitled, uh, The Origins and Future Demise of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And I, I, I kind of like the title. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out at some point. Uh, very intrigued by that. But uh, in addition to thanking uh, Professor Armstrong and President Sakurai, I'd like to, to thank, uh, kind of in a corporate sense, uh, both the Japan and Korea societies for having arranged, uh, co-organized uh, this uh, event uh, and for bringing uh, all of you here uh, tonight uh, to listen. Both um, societies uh, play an indispensable role, not just in educating the American public uh, about issues that affect uh, East Asia, uh, but also in informing uh, the national conversation on some of the most challenging and urgent foreign policy issues confronting uh, the United States today. And it's on one such issue, arguably one of the more challenging and vexing, uh, North Korea, of course, that I'd like to focus tonight. Now, I think everybody in this room knows that North Korea uh, has, uh, has another formal name, and that's the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK uh, for short. And it's true that uh, North Korea has been capturing the headlines of late um, quite, uh, quite dramatically. A few weeks ago, North Korea was issuing bellicose threats against the United States and the Republic of Korea on an almost daily basis. Its threat of the day strategy uh, triggered uh, kind of a strange migration, in fact. Flux of US journalists and other Western journalists uh, converged uh, on uh, South Korea's capital city, Seoul, as if they expected a war to break out at any moment. The media was a bit baffled when they arrived in uh, Seoul and found South Koreans going about their daily lives as they always do. Ordinary citizens in Seoul said they were aware, of course, of North Korea's threats and bluster, but that given the uh, numbing repetition of threats from the Pyongyang uh, regime over the years, they were not paying them much mind. In fact, one commentator even joked when asked whether there were signs of North Korean military preparations. He said, the only thing that's massing on the Korean peninsula 
were Western uh, journalists, and I think that was very much the case at the time. Uh, but this is really uh, not a laughing matter. We shouldn't make light of it. Uh, it, it has been a quite sustained, almost unprecedented, uh, threatening display from Pyongyang. Uh, let's consider just a partial list of what North Korea in recent weeks has said and what they have done. The regime claimed, not for the first time, that the 1953 armistice was dead. It warned uh, repeatedly and graphically of the growing prospects of nuclear war. It reiterated threats of strategic strikes on the territory of the United States and the Republic of Korea, even resorting to YouTube uh, to make its point. It unveiled at its Workers' Party plenum plans to develop nuclear weapons and somehow at the same time to pursue uh, economic development. Through its Supreme People's Assembly, the regime asserted its status as a, quote, full-fledged nuclear weapon state, and quote, it announced its intent to restart and repurpose its Yongbyon nuclear complex, and most recently, as we all know, it suspended operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which provided employment to over 50,000 North Korean workers at 123 South Korean-run companies. Now, these threats and uh, actions occurred in the aftermath of the most provocative and dangerous of all of North Korea's recent steps, its explosive test on February 12 of a nuclear device. In this century, only one nation on Earth has exploded nuclear weapons, North Korea. And as a result of that test, the United Nations Security Council unanimously adopted a tough resolution condemning North Korea's action. We, of course, all of us who follow North Korea or work on it, have all been here before with uh, the DPRK. That February test, North Korea's third, uh, defied existing UN Security Council prohibitions and brought down upon Pyongyang additional tougher international sanctions. And of course, we need only look back to December of last year to find another of the North's big bangs, its launch of a satellite using ballistic missile technology, an action that was also in violation of Security Council resolutions and also earned North Korea unanimous censure by that same 16-nation United Nations body. As the DPRK has shirked its international responsibilities and, com and uh, commitments and ratcheted up its rhetoric, the international community has not been idle. The international community has stood up forging a remarkable consensus against North Korea's dangerous, destabilizing actions. Over 80 countries, which is somewhat remarkable, 80 countries and international organizations issued statements criticizing North Korea's nuclear test, a remarkable chorus of condemnation. The world is uh, wise to the increasing threat North Korea poses to regional and global peace and stability, to international norms of behavior on, any, on everything from arms proliferation to human rights, indeed, to the very vision advanced by President Obama in his Prague speech and embraced since by so many to move toward a world without nuclear weapons. The truly sad thing about all of this is it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to happen like this. North Korea's two missile launches and nuclear tests over the last 13 months and its recent serial threats unraveled what had been a nearly year-long United States diplomatic effort to engage the DPRK. Before discussing in greater depth the recent events I've just described, I'd like to back up a bit to a more promising period and talk about the series of U.S.-North Korea engagements that started in summer 2011 and eventually culminated in the so-called U.S. DPRK Leap Day understanding of February 29, 2012. I'll then talk briefly about the aftermath of North Korea's April 2012 launch, a launch that scuttled the Leap Day arrangement and then turned to the fallout from its nuclear test. I'll then conclude with some thoughts on diplomatic prospects for, for the months ahead, after which I hope we can engage in a little bit of a conversation about these issues. Now, everyone I think in this room uh, knows that President Obama, when he came to office in 2009, directed his administration to engage North Korea if Pyongyang demonstrated a willingness to fulfill its denuclearization commitments and address other concerns. In the months that followed, however, the DPRK responded with a series of provocations. It launched a long-range missile. It declared it would 
would reverse its disablement steps uh, at its nuclear complex. It kicked out monitors from the International Atomic Energy Agency and US experts. It announced its withdrawal from the six-party talks, and in May 2009, it tested for the second time a nuclear explosive device. At the same time, in March 2009, the North suspended a United States food assistance program, which was to provide a half million metric tons of nutritional assistance for needy North Koreans. US and international personnel were uh, expelled from the country after just one third of that uh, half million metric tons had been distributed. And then, if at all possible, uh, the situation got even uh, worse. 2010 deepened the sense of crisis. North Korea sank an ROK Navy vessel, uh, the Chonan. It shelled and killed South Korean civilians and soldiers on Yongpyong Island. It finally, uh, to top it off, uh, revealed to the world a uranium enrichment program. All of this made diplomatic engagement with North Korea at the time exceedingly difficult. Nonetheless, the United States, after an interval, engaged the DPRK in three rounds of talks in three cities over the course of 10 months. The purpose of this effort was to explore a possible resumption uh, of six-party talks by concluding a bilateral understanding between the United States uh, and North Korea. The first round took place in New York in July 2011, the second in Geneva in October uh, 2011, and the third and final in Beijing in late February 2012, just a few short months after Kim Jong-il's death the preceding December. Now, uh, I was parachuted into this diplomatic process in time uh, for the second round of negotiations in Geneva. I was to replace, uh, as Professor Armstrong has pointed out, the legendary Ambassador Stephen Bosworth, who had done a terrific job of getting us through several tough years on North Korea, the years I've just described, particularly the, the events of 2010 that I, that I mentioned. Steve was the one who launched us on the more positive diplomatic trajectory that I uh, inherited. I uh, inherited the reins uh, from Steve on December 1st, 2011. I wasn't formally announced till next month, but they set me to work, as often happens in the State Department, a month ahead of time. And I uh, did what somebody in my job should do. Within five days, I was off to Seoul, Tokyo, and Beijing to talk to those governments. Uh, then I came back, and days after my return, North Korea announced that Kim Jong-il had died uh, on uh, December 17th. Now this timing is important because we had been scheduled to meet with the North Koreans in Beijing the week before Christmas 2011 for the third and last meeting before uh, we expected to have a deal to announce. That meeting, however, was put on hold because of uh, Kim Jong-il's death uh, and the uh, funeral that followed. But Pyongyang, after uh, several months, uh, signaled to us they were ready to pick up again with our talks, so we met as I said, for the third round in Beijing in late February of last year. The Beijing uh, talks resulted in this so-called February 29 understanding or leap day deal uh, as, as it's known. The deal was quite modest. It was meant to establish confidence building measures and pave the way for the resumption of the six party talks. It was not meant to cover everything, but instead to test each side's sincerity. North Korea, committed to a moratorium on nuclear tests, on long-range missile launches, and on its uranium enrichment activity. It also promised to allow international inspectors to return to Yongbyon to monitor North Korean compliance with its pledge. The United States, for our part, pledged security guarantees. But in a dramatic twist, just two weeks later, in mid-March, North Korea scuttled uh, it sank the Leap Day deal. It announced its intent to launch a satellite to mark the 100-year anniversary of Kim Il-sung's birth uh, in mid-April, April 15th. Uh, within hours of that announcement, all five of the other six-party uh, states, the Republic of Korea, uh, Japan, China, Russia, and the United States, had denounced the DPRK's announcement. And in the days that followed, dozens of other nations and groups of nations had taken up the call. There then followed uh, a four-week period that was somewhat dramatic of intensive public and private calls on North Korea not to proceed with the launch, including uh, strong efforts from the People's Republic of China. Pyongyang, on April 13th, went ahead and attempted 
uh, the launch. Now, the launch was quite destructive. It did more than put an end to almost a year's worth of diplomatic efforts. It also, sadly, ended humanitarian efforts we had been working on uh, from the United States side for quite some time. We had hoped to restart the process of providing nutritional assistance to vulnerable North Koreans, essentially the very young and very old, who no longer receive uh, adequate food from the state. This was not because we linked humanitarian and diplomatic efforts. We did not, and we do not. It was because we could not trust Pyongyang to live up to its end of the nutritional assistance deal. At the international level, the launch triggered unanimous censure, as I said, from the United Nations. With unprecedented speed, the Council, essentially over the course of a weekend, which is quite rare uh, in uh, United Nations uh, uh, practice, adopted a strong presidential statement condemning the launch as a, quote, serious violation, end quote, of UN resolutions. The Council also expanded existing UN sanctions, which the United States, of course, continues to implement fully. By reneging on its commitments announced on February 29th, North Korea not only spurned an improved relationship with the United States and a path back to negotiations, but it also made its priorities crystal clear. It was choosing confrontation over diplomatic collaboration and isolation over engagement. And we have seen this with increasing cl clarity throughout the last year. North Korea's stream of bellicose rhetoric, flagrant ongoing violations of UN Security Council resolutions, December 12th rocket launch, and February 12th nuclear test, all dug the DPRK deeper into its international hole. In the wake of North Korea's provocative actions and threats, National Security uh, Advisor Tom Donilon outlined in his March 11th speech at the Asia Society the four key principles on which US policy toward North Korea rests. First, close and expanded cooperation with Japan and South Korea, as well as with China. Second, we have made clear our openness to authentic and credible negotiations with North Korea. In return, of course, we've only seen provocations and extreme rhetoric. And we've uh, uh, said, and Tom Donilon made it clear in the speech, that we refuse to reward a bad North Korean behavior. Third, the United States is committed to the defense of our homeland and uh, our allies. Fourth, we will continue to encourage North Korea to choose a better path. As he, had said, as he has said many times, President Obama is willing to offer his hand to those who would unclench their fists. Needless to say, North Korea was at the top of the agenda during Secretary Kerry's first trip to Asia, April 11th through 15th. In Seoul, uh, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Yun byun tse adopted a joint statement in which the United States and the ROK agreed on the importance of the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. In Tokyo, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Kishida agreed North Korea must stop its provocative speech and behavior and show it is taking specific steps towards denuclearization. In Beijing, Secretary Kerry and his Chinese hosts, including President Xi Jinping and other top leaders, underscored the joint US-China commitment to denuclearization. Uh, Secretary Kerry and State Counselor Yang Jiechi agreed that resolving the nuclear issue is critically important for the stability of the region and the world and announced further US-China discussions on how to accomplish our shared goals. Two weeks ago, following up on Secretary uh, Kerry's meetings in Beijing, I, at my level, had a productive set of meetings with China's special representative for Korean Peninsula Affairs, Ambassador Wu Dawei. This week, Republic of Korea President Park Geun-hye visited the United States on her first trip in office. On the margins of her visit, I met with my South Korean uh, counterpart, Ambassador Im Sung-nam. In the joint declaration uh, of the 60th anniversary of the US ROK alliance issued in Washington, our leaders expressed deep concern about North Korea's nuclear uh, and ballistic missile programs, its repeated provocations, and its proliferation activities. We reaffirmed our shared determination to achieve the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We also re-extended the invitation for North Korea to join the international community and called on Pyongyang to invest in and improve the conditions of its citizens to respect their basic human rights. 
we continue our active engagement with our Japanese allies in equal measure. I met with Japanese Director General for Asian Affairs Shinsuke Sugiyama when he was in Washington uh, in mid-April. Secretary Kerry, in addition to meeting with uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe and Foreign Minister Kishida during his uh, visit uh, to Tokyo, also met with family members of abductees on April 15th. The United States remains committed to supporting the government of Japan and seeking the transparent resolution of the abductions issue. We will never forget in the United States the suffering of the abductees or the pain that their families feel uh, in their absence. The strength of our policy toward North Korea is based on close coordination with our South Korean and Japanese allies, US-Japan and US-ROK bilateral cooperation, as well as close trilateral coordination has been essential not only in responding to provocations and threats, but also in addressing such issues as human rights, particularly within multilateral fora, uh, as all three countries currently serve on the United Nations Human Rights Council. Our three countries share democratic values, a commitment to international peace and stability in Northeast Asia, and a dedication to international cooperation and the rule of law, shared values that are essential to address all aspects of the challenge presented by North Korea. It is crucial that the United States, Japan, and the ROK work together, along with our Chinese and Russian partners, to prevent North Korea from exploiting any perceived differences in our unified position. That is why, next week, I will travel to the region to continue consultations on the way forward with my counterparts in Seoul, Tokyo, and Beijing. Now, in my final few minutes, what I'd like to do is just talk briefly about the future um, of, of North Korea. Uh, until recently, and this was certainly true at the beginning of last year, there had been much talk, uh, perhaps quite a bit of hope, too, that change was occurring in North Korea under their new leader, Kim Jong-un, uh, at the age of 28 or 29, the youngest leader uh, on Earth. Despite his fresh image and promising rhetoric of a better future, for North Korea's people, Kim Jong-un's changes proved to be stylistic, not substantive. He has rooted his vision for his country firmly in the past. A small, privileged elite continues to lavish resources on long-range missile and nuclear projects, as well as luxuries for their own gratification at the expense of his long-suffering subjects. While Pyongyang may have received a facelift and a few members of the elite have been profiting, the vast majority of North Korea's 25 million people live in poverty beyond their gleaming capital without permission even to visit it. So we remain gravely concerned about the grievous human rights situation in the DPRK and about the well-being of North Korea's people. Reports suggest that the regime has locked away between 100,000 and 200,000 citizens in a vast network of political prisons where inmates are subjected to forced labor and to inhuman conditions. The decision to sentence them is done with it. no pretense of due process. Promoting human rights, therefore, is a key component of our North Korea policy. Likewise, we have urged North Korean authorities to grant detained US citizen Kenneth Bay amnesty on humanitarian grounds and immediate release. There is no greater priority uh, for us in the United States government than the welfare and safety of US citizens abroad. While we have not yet seen uh, North Korea take action to, to improve conditions for its citizens, we have seen the international community take strong measures to increase pressure uh, on Pyongyang and to, uh, to improve its human rights record. Acting by consensus, the UN Human Rights Council recently established an independent commission of inquiry to investigate North Korea's widespread systemic human rights violations. This resolution was introduced by Japan and the European Union with the co-sponsorship of the United States, South Korea, and a number of other nations. This step by the United Nations is meant to sharpen the choices facing the North Korean regime, and it must be said that we would welcome meaningful measures, economic uh, or otherwise, that would improve the lives of the people of North Korea. One way, quite frankly, for Pyongyang to do this would be to undertake uh, good faith efforts to denuclearize something that, that would offer tangible benefits to all parties involved. We in the United States government have been consistent on this score. We've long made clear that we are open to improved relations 
with North Korea if it is willing to take concrete steps to live up to its international obligations and commitments, though, uh, given the events of the past year, the bar for a resumption of meaningful engagement is certainly now <clears throat> much higher. President Obama put it best during a major speech he gave in November of last year in Burma. In a passage directed uh, precisely at Pyongyang, he said, let go of your nuclear weapons and choose the path of peace and progress. If you do, you will find an extended hand from the United States of America. Just two days ago, in his joint press conference with President Park in Washington, the president came back to this theme. He exhorted Pyongyang to, quote, take notice of events in countries like Burma, which, as it reforms, is seeing more trade and investment and diplomatic ties with the world. Furthermore, if North Korea ultimately wants to take steps to join the international community, it needs to refrain from actions that threaten the peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia and comply with its commitments in the September 2005 joint statement of the six-party talks and its obligations under relevant UN Security Council resolutions to abandon all nuclear weapons and existing nuclear programs. Finally, we have also uh, long emphasized that without sustained improvement in inter-Korean relations, the US DPRK ties uh, cannot fundamentally improve. Pyongyang must understand this, and this is a point that uh, I have made directly to North Korean negotiators. So, to sum up, the ball is in North Korea's court and its choice is clear. Concrete steps toward uh, denuclearization can lead to a path of peace, prosperity, and approved ties with the world, including, of course, with the United States. But if Pyongyang uh, instead elects to ignore its commitments to denuclearize and continues to engage in destabilizing provocations, it will face only further international isolation. We hope Pyongyang will make the right choice, the choice to build stability and usher in promising prospects for a durable peace on the Korean Peninsula. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments and your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Davis, for your extremely timely, wide-ranging, and insightful remarks. We're going to be taking questions from the audience now. There is a microphone somewhere that will be going around uh, to the audience members. And when you do come up to give your question, please identify yourself, your name, and the institution from which you are coming. But if I may, I'd like to begin with, with one question, uh, not a, a simple one to answer, I think, but uh, a rather large one. You are. Uh, tasked with, uh, uh, with overseeing American participation in the six-party process, which mm. uh, presumes that the six-party process is not dead, as many people think it is. So my question is, what would be necessary to resume the six-party talks, uh, and what would be the primary subject of discussion, given that North Korea has now said repeatedly it will not give up its nuclear weapons, which was, after all, the main uh, objective of the talks when they began 10 yes, years ago. Yes, no, that's a, that is the key question for those of us in the diplomatic business, obviously, is how do we get back to what we, uh, um, uh, what we are placed uh, here to do, which is to try to resolve problems like this, uh, problems that in this case that have festered for 60 years, peacefully and diplomatically, not through uh, any other means. And it's terrible to contemplate uh, how else uh, the situation could go on the peninsula if we can't find a way forward diplomatically. In a sense, what I said to all of you, uh, I mean, it was, it, I, I, of course, had a whole long list of points that the State Department wanted me to make, and I made them. Uh, but the boil down, the boil down uh, of all of this is we're really at a time when um, uh, it's up to North Korea. And, and I think we have in this third generation of North Korean leadership, remember, as you well know, North Korea is the only example of a, of a uh, uh, so-called communist state that has had a dynastic uh, leadership system, father to son, now, now three times. Uh, we're, we're in a phase where it's up to them uh, to, to make a move, and I think we're seeing beginning to see what this uh, young man, Kim Jong-un, is all about. And we're beginning to see that he is a bit of a throwback, but uh, he, he may even be approaching these, uh, these issues more, more intensively, more provocatively, uh, in a sense, uh, a bit more, bit more dangerously. Uh, so 
Uh, sadly, uh, in, in the, what's called the dual track policy of the United States, which is pressure when we must and engagement when we can, we're in a pressure phase. We simply are. We're trying to sharpen North Korea's choices. We're trying to close off avenues to them other than this peaceful diplomatic uh, way forward. Uh, and so even though, sadly, I'm not engaged in six-party talks, uh, which would be uh, nice to get back to it, uh, in the right context, uh, there's lots of work to do with our other four partners in the six-party uh, process and with the rest of the world, which is increasingly interested in this issue. So it, that's why I put the accent on what it is North Korea uh, has to do. Uh, we need signals from them that are solid. We need them to take steps to demonstrate that they're serious about moving forward. Sadly, they're going in the other direction by renouncing their obligations that they made in September 2005 in the core document of, of the six-party uh, talks. Uh, and through all of these other provocations and threats and renunciation of their, uh, uh, of their obligations to denuclearize. So um, it's a tough moment diplomatically, but uh, we've been in these moments before. And I think if we stick together and take a principled approach and uh, US, Japan, Korea work uh, tightly together and also with China and Russia, uh, we'll get there eventually. Thank you. Yes, we have a question back there. It's uh, James Squire from the United Kingdom Mission to the UN. Um, I follow uh, DPRK amongst other issues. Um, thank you very much to Ambassador Davies for your talk this evening. Um, I just had one question which seems, uh, it's a, it seems to be an enigma, uh, but I'd very much value your take on it, which is, um, in your view, who is it that takes the decisions in the DPRK? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. It might even be a question that's better directed at the professor than at me. Um, I don't know either. There's, there's, lots of, <laughs> there, there's, there's lots of speculation about this. A lot of uh, uh, very experienced uh, analysts uh, are looking at it. Uh, nobody knows because it's a very uh, opaque uh, kind of closed system. But I think you can at least say this, which is that, as I alluded to you know, a year ago, after this uh, young man came to power, uh, and we began to see these um, sort of outward signs that he was interested in being a bit different, uh, uh, more accessible uh, than his, than his, than his uh, father. Remember, his father ruled for 17 years. And I think there's only one sentence fragment in 17 years that uh, was broadcast, we think, by mistake to the North Korean people. So they heard their leader speak once uh, a few words in 17 years. This young man gives speeches. Uh, he seems interested in uh, the welfare, at least, of the elites of Pyongyang. He uh, uh, has a, a very attractive wife who uh, has, has been public. So he, he showed some signs of an interest in presenting a bit more modern face. He talked about um, uh, how to improve his, his economy. Uh, and so this debate emerged at the time, well, maybe this is collective leadership. Uh, maybe there are others uh, behind the scenes, his famous uncle, his, his aunt, uh, uh, or, or the military, or those in the party who are calling the shots or helping him along. That debate has largely evaporated. I mean, there are some who still uh, talk uh, about that prospect. But I think it's increasingly clear that the logic of the North Korean system is um, uh, at work. And according to the logic of that system, there must be one paramount leader who heads the party, the state, the army. Uh, who has all six of the titles that uh, have now become tr traditional for uh, a, a North Korean leader. Uh, and I think for all intents and purposes, however the mechanics might work in practice, all roads, all decision making goes to him. And all decisions come from that mountaintop down uh, through uh, the instrumentalities of the DPRK and are put in place. Uh, beyond that, um, uh, we don't know. And it's, it's a hard target. Uh, one uh, famous uh, American who uh, served as both station chief uh, for the CIA in Seoul and then later became our ambassador to South Korea, uh, Ambassador Gregg, once famously, famously said, somewhat jokingly, that, that it's the longest running intelligence failure uh, sort of you know, in, in, in modern history. And that's a bit of an exaggeration. Our intelligence community does a great job. But uh, the truth is, it's a very, very hard to know. Uh, what have we got uh, over here? Yes, back there. Yes. 
Chairman Rutherford Pokes. Ambassador Davis, you spoke with some interest in the possibility, I think, that the six party talks could accomplish anything. And that some appeal to the government of North Korea would be responded in a positive way. Yeah. Is there really any hope of that? It seems to me that the only hope is that China will put the only leverage that the world has on North Korea to refrain from carrying out the threats. Hmm. Yeah, uh, every single question is, is actually uh, exactly on message and on point here. Thank you for that. that um, I think to a great extent, uh, there, there is uh, uh, increasing expectation that China should use its unique relationship with North Korea to try to impress upon uh, the leadership there the need to take a different direction, a direction uh, of diplomacy and, and peaceful resolution of these problems and step away from military threats uh, and provocation. So I think that's right. Your larger question, your first question about you know, is there hope, of course there is. Uh, there's always hope for diplomacy. I often use the example of my father who joined the US Foreign Service uh, as a junior officer in 1947 after uh, crossing the Normandy beaches and serving as a sergeant in the US Army comes into the uh, State Department, becomes a Sovietologist, works on Russia. Uh, I, my first memories in life were of life in Moscow, and he served in Moscow a couple of times and on the periphery of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, he worked at it for 30 plus years. He retired, and about nine years after he retired, what happened in 1989? So uh, I think there's always hope for diplomacy. It, uh, this is a case where we have to keep chipping away at it. It's, tectonic, it's a bit glacial, it's been going on a long time, but we should never give up on diplomacy. We need to always uh, try to put the accent on, on, on diplomacy. Uh, I am actually, uh, in, in a strange way, somewhat optimistic that we'll eventually get there, and largely that's because of this growing, gathering international consensus. I mean, 80 nations uh, issuing statements of condemnation, uh, China beginning to take steps that were, would have been unimaginable uh, even 12 months ago uh, to signal to North Korea its displeasure with some of North Korea's uh, actions. So I think if we can keep this up, we can stick together, uh, send these messages to North Korea, narrow its choices, keep pointing them in the direction of engagement and living up to their promises and obligations, I think we can get there. And uh, you know, the last thing I'll say is uh, the main reason we have to keep at it is the alternative or alternatives are honestly unthinkable uh, for the future of uh, not just the Korean Peninsula, which has now become so important because of the ROK uh, economic miracle and the fact that, our, uh, that uh, South Korea is now an international player, uh, but because it's right smack in the middle of arguably the most important engine of uh, growth in the world uh, today. So we've got to solve this diplomatically. And uh, that's why we're encouraging everyone uh, with a voice uh, to send messages to Pyongyang, quite frankly, also to Beijing, to get back onto the diplomatic path. Thank you. I wonder if we can get someone over here. Yes, back there, in the pink. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Davies for your um, talk. Now, my concern is I, I work in China and in uh, South Korea as an um, educational consultant with public school systems and some in South Korea with private school systems but um, run by the government. I was there the week you were speaking of a, a few weeks ago when they were talking about the, um, the factory being closed down. And I as you say, I was with South Koreans and they acted like it's same old, same old. Yeah. Then I'd get back and turn on the BBC and then I'd think, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? So yeah. now I have to go back in June. What my question is, what's your criteria for saying to foreigners, now's the time to leave South Korea? And I have to say, I'm glad you're going to go back too. Sure. <laughs> well. Uh, we, we, we have never said uh, to our own citizens that they should leave South Korea. In fact, quite the opposite. The, you know, the, the, uh, uh, 
the messages that we, we send to our citizens who live or travel in the Republic of Korea have been uh, very reassuring. And we've said that there is no reason to uh, you know, uh, change your plans. Uh, and uh, you know, we've taken uh, really a, a, uh, uh, taken to heart the way the Republic of Korea has reacted to these threats and these provocations from North Korea. In fact, you know, it was fascinating. And some who follow this closely, you probably know that there was a time not so many weeks ago when the North Koreans called in all of the couple of dozen foreign embassies in Pyongyang. And they said to them, you know, there's going to be a nuclear war. Uh, the Americans are hostile. They're going to attack. So therefore, uh, if you want to evacuate, we'll help you evacuate. And, and one, uh, I, I saw one uh, expert on TV say it might, be, it might have been the only time in history that a host government called in ambassadors from a, a, a range of countries said, war's coming, time to go. And every single one of them said, thank you very much, but we're really going to stay here. Because, because everyone knew the United States was you know, we, uh, w w The United States for 60 years has done the exact opposite. We've done everything we can to prevent a recurrence of the war that broke out in the early uh, 1950s. So uh, uh, that was yet another attempt by North Korea to kind of capture a news cycle and engage in this kind of fright of the day uh, tactics. Uh, and for a while, it, you know, it, it got the attention of the world's media. And that's why we were treated to the site of Western journalists on the streets of Seoul sort of say, where's the war? I thought there was a war coming here. So I, I, you know, I, I don't change your plans. I'm going back. I'm not going to think twice about it. Uh, the United States is working with South Korea to uh, ensure that we're ready for any contingency that arises. Uh, and uh, I would counsel you not to be concerned by the scare talk that comes from North Korea. Yes, up here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Davis, for your comments. Thank you, Professor Armstrong. Uh, I just wanted to press you a little bit further and get your views on the following. How stable, or rather how unstable, the region is becoming, given the fact that over the last 60 years, as you point out, our tacit effort has been not to get into a warlike scenario and to follow the dwell track. But ultimately, we are at a state where, from a nuclear proliferation standpoint, we've not been able to do much. And we continue to believe that there is an internal logic which will always stop North Korea from precipitating matters like it did twice under President Lee, attacking an island, sinking a ship. So how unstable has the region become? How uh, Japan and South Korea and others, how rightful they are in their thinking that they should be nuclearizing? I want your views on it. Right. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, there were a few voices raised in, in both uh, Seoul and Tokyo uh, um, to, uh, you know, arguing that, that perhaps a debate should be begun about this, uh, about this uh, uh, matter, but that's not mainstream thinking in either country. And in fact, one of the things that uh, President Park Geun-hye said when she came to Washington was, uh, you know, the exact opposite. That uh, that's not the intention of the Republic of Korea to, uh, you know, walk away from their uh, commitments to the to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and develop nuclear weapons. They're not uh, interested in doing that. I don't think the Japanese see that in their interest either. I mean, I uh, so. Uh, uh, you know, I think those concerns and fears are overblown. I don't think the region is destabilized. I think there is this issue, this problem, this uh, kind of festering challenge that we've got in, in, in North Korea. But I, you know, I don't think the North Korean regime is suicidal. I don't think that they're going to take steps that will uh, you know, bring down upon them uh, a reaction that, that, uh, that, that, that would uh, uh, you know, cause them a great difficulty. Uh, we certainly hope that's the case. Uh, there's no reason for them to do that because no one is threatening their existence. Nobody is, uh, uh, you know, in a, uh, a, a an aggressive posture toward uh, North Korea. All of our actions with the South Koreans uh, are defensive, and we make a very, uh, we put a very fine point on that uh, every time we have exercises with the South Koreans or uh, engage in in, in military. Uh, uh, talks with them. Uh, but what is happening is that because this threat is 
uh, is there, the nuclear threat, the missile threat. Uh, uh, the neighboring countries have to react to that. They have to take steps to react to that, uh, and uh, as do we, because we are a Pacific power, we are an Asian power, and we have this alliance relationship that's very uh, critical with both, uh, uh, with both uh, Japan and with uh, South Korea. So we will uh, uh, remain true to that, and I think that through our combined efforts, uh, and through constantly pressing to try to get diplomatic processes going, if the North Koreans will simply take the right initial steps, uh, we're, we're, we will avoid the, the kinds of scenarios that will lead to uh, really drastic solutions such as you've touched on. May I add to that very briefly, uh, and Ambassador, you're free to disagree with me since I'm not in the field, but it seems to me that we have to understand that Nor the North Korean leadership is not insane uh, they're not suicidal, I agree, and they're not even irrational. We have to try to understand the rationality which drives them and, and the priorities which they have. And, and I, I also happen to believe that Kim Jong-un is in charge, uh, although he certainly has help. Uh, the first priority is defense of the regime, security of the regime, which they do seem to feel threatened, although this, this bluster also has a certain domestic uh, intention as well to get the people rallied around the leadership. Number two is the defense of the uh, elite in the regime, uh, which, is, which is a very important priority. And uh, any kind of economic development or reform is very much a, a third priority on the list. So to get them to change, I think, through appealing to their economic self-interest is not going to be as successful mm. as a first measure as it is to try to address these security concerns directly, it, it, it seems to me. Uh, they may, again, they may be uh, uh, unpredictable in a certain sense, but I don't think the regime is, is irrational and certainly not crazy. I agree. I agree completely. And, and, and you know, we're counting on that as we try to work through this. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, up here. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I'm Eun Kim from Goldman Sachs. I have three questions for you. Uh, first question is related to North Korea's nuclear weapons capability. Mm. Uh, there have been some intelligence um, sort of suggesting that they might be capable of reaching the west coast of the United States. And mm. I know that the president recently came out in public to deny that. Um, and I was wondering if you have any uh, insights on that. The second question is related to the new South Korean President Park's um, so-called trust politic. Uh, trust-based relationship uh, with North Korea, and just wondering if you have any thoughts on how that would differ from her predecessor, President Lee, mm. uh, in her approach towards North Korea and how that might change the dynamics between South Korea and North Korea and in the U.S. The third question is related to the recent news about the, um, South, the Korean American lady who's being held captive in, in North Korea currently and facing a trial, and whether or not you see that as a sort of turning point and like a diplomatic opportunity for you to get engaged. Sure. Well, on, on your technical question about, about missiles, look, I mean, you know, uh, I hope you'll excuse me and understand, but one thing we, we, we can't do, and we get shot at dawn if we do it, is talk about intelligence matters. We just can't do that. But I think, you know, what I can say is that uh, we saw what North Korea can do. Uh, what they uh, achieved uh, with their December 12th launch was they managed to put an object in orbit. So they mastered the technology to control a three-stage uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, or a type missile. Uh, that's serious stuff. That's very serious stuff. If they can do that, uh, they're on the road uh, to eventually, uh, potentially, developing uh, you know, better versions that they might be able to control and target in, in ways that uh, we, we have to take uh, absolutely uh, seriously. Separate question about whether they've yet miniaturized a nuclear device that they could mate to a missile. And you know, you can, I mean, there are lots of experts out there. I'm not one, I'm not a missile man, but lots of uh, experts who will, uh, can kind of take you through that. But, uh, but you know, it's our estimation, and of course, no one more authoritative than the President of the United States, that you know, they're not there yet. Uh, th there's a lot more that they would have to do. The important thing is to uh, get them to, uh, to uh, 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 you know, to back off from that and to live up to their uh, uh, commitments and UN uh, resolutions. Now, on uh, uh, trust politique and President uh, Park's uh, um, uh, sort of conception of 
how to deal with North Korea. The message that um, came out of the summit meeting between the two presidents at Washington just days ago was that the United States is uh, you know, very eager to work with uh, the Republic of Korea uh, uh, as they move forward on trust policy. Uh, President uh, Park is, uh, she uh, strikes me as a realist, and she said a lot about why it is that she can't go uh, at quite the speed she'd wish to go in terms of uh, reaching out to engage uh, the North. But I think there's room for uh, this kind of, uh, 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 of action as well. I think uh, there's, you know, South Korea is a very different country than it was a generation ago. Uh, and I think uh, she stands on the shoulders, frankly, of uh, all uh, South Korea's presidents that have gone before, including her uh, predecessor, uh, Im Young Bak. And what I'm not going to get into is trying to handicap or compare the two. And I'm sorry, oh, uh, Kenneth Bay, the American. You wanted to ask about Kenneth Bay. Uh, this is an, uh, an American citizen who's been uh, held by the North Koreans now for a long time, I think uh, going on 200 days or so. Um, it's um, uh, what we have said is we have called on North Korea to grant him amnesty and to release him on humanitarian grounds. He has some medical issues. Uh, we've uh, done this directly through a thing called the New York Channel, which is how we communicate with the North Koreans. Uh, we've done this uh, through uh, uh, you know, uh, messaging as well. Uh, and uh, we think it's very important uh, for uh, the DPRK to uh, you know, live up to their responsibilities uh, and to treat this American right. Uh, and we have called on them to uh, release him. I, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a leap to try to link that with diplomacy, uh, quite frankly. I mean, we know the history of Americans who've been taken uh, prisoner by uh, the North, and we, we know how many of those have uh, ended up. Uh, we'll see where this goes. Meantime, we're going to keep uh, you know, sending strong messages to North Korea to treat him well and to release him. Uh, uh, and uh, the most important thing is that he, uh, in the meanwhile, be allowed to talk to his family uh, and that the uh, Swedish authorities in Pyongyang, they have an embassy there, uh, that they be uh, permitted uh, access to him. And they've only had three meetings, I think three or four, in, in almost 200 days, and that's egregiously insufficient. So. These are the kinds of messages that we're sending to the North. I think we have time for one more question there in the middle. Yes. I'm Calvin Hoba, a student on leave from Colombia. <clears throat> the late uh, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya uh, uh, voluntarily gave up his nuclear program. The West then uh, helped the rebels uh, overthrow him, and he was hunted down and executed at Pistol Point. Given that history, do you really seriously believe that the North will uh, give up its nuclear weapons? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting because in you know I talked. Uh, I've been in negotiations with North Koreans on a couple of occasions, and uh, this is actually something that they've uh, they've raised. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, it's it's a very oversimplified analogy. That I, I'm not, you know, I, not a, I'm not a Middle East expert, but I'm not sure I'm convinced that Muammar Gaddafi ended up, uh, you know, being killed by, uh, you know, his own citizens because he gave up nuclear weapons. Uh, and and if that's the lesson that North Korea has taken from that, I think it uh, they they uh, are probably not correctly interpreting it. Um, but uh, you know, other countries have given up nuclear weapons. Uh, South Africa gave up nuclear weapons, uh, as have as have other nations. And uh, I don't think there's really a linkage between that and the fate of a state uh, necessarily. Uh, the Soviet Union had uh, tens of thousands of nuclear weapons and dissolved into 16 different nations, uh, including the Russian Federation. Probably the best example that is a counterexample of that. What we say to the North Koreans, what I said to my opposite number in Beijing at our two days of talks was, I said, we would like you to please examine the example and lesson of Burma, Myanmar, and how quickly the United States can react in a positive fashion if 
uh, you and North Korea make a decision to go in a different direction, end your isolation, come back into the international system, live up your obligations. Um, uh, so that's the historical lesson that we think is uh, North Korea really should be looking at rather than trying somehow to conflate um, Omar Gaddafi's fate uh, with what might happen to their own uh, leadership. And we have repeatedly, uh, I did it, but others before me have in the past as well, provided security guarantees to North Korea. And it's not our interest or intent to, uh, to uh, act in an aggressive fashion toward them. So um, I, I've heard, I hear that a lot. You know, Gaddafi, nuclear weapons equals you know, a reason why the North shouldn't give up uh, their nascent nuclear program. But I just, I, I have to tell you, I don't buy it. I'd be interested to hear what the professor has to say about that. Actually, uh, <laughs> I think we're out of time, but uh, <laughs> no, I think, I think that the, the analogy is, is, is problematic. Uh, I, but, I, uh, but I do think it's in the, in the, the minds of some of the North Korean leadership. And, and that has to simply be discussed. Sure. And they need to be dissuaded of, of, that, of going down that road. Sure. I do believe we're out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Okay.